Ancuccio. Ong cùng những việc bạc to, bạc chân bạc đi tìm 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 លោកហរីលរីកាពីស្ថានភាពវត្តមានអវត្តមានភិក្ខីនិងបុគ្គលដែលអញ្ចឹងប្រះក៏ជឿញាចូលរួមនៅក្នុងកិច្ចចំណា
Oui, bonjour Monsieur le Président, bonjour à l'ensemble de la Chambre et des partis. Je tenais dès à présent à indiquer qu'également du côté de la défense de Pio Sampan, les deux jours alloués à l'ensemble de la défense nous apparaissent insuffisants pour traiter de l'ensemble des sujets qui ont déjà été traités dans le cadre de l'interrogatoire des coprocureurs et des partis civils. Contrairement à l'usage de la Chambre euh, qui jusqu'à présent avait donné un temps égal entre euh, les, les, les coprocureurs et partis civils et les équipes de défense euh, pour euh, M. Eder, vous aviez indiqué que nous n'avions droit qu'à deux jours, compte tenu des euh, développements récents de ces derniers jours et de l'extension euh, de temps qui a été accordée à, à M. le coprocureur. Vous comprendrez qu'également du côté de la défense, compte tenu de la masse de documents qui a été envisagé. Nous avons également besoin de revenir sur un bon nombre de documents. Cela prend du temps. Et comme souvent l'équipe de défense arrive en fin de course, et souvent peut-être le moment où la patience de la Chambre est moins importante, je tenais dès à présent à, à vous indiquer que nous aurons à, nous aussi besoin à, pleinement et de notre journée et à, de à, à, une heure et demie supplémentaire à, à mon sens correspondant à deux jours et demi d'interrogatoire pour l'ensemble des défenses. Je tenais à faire cette précision dès maintenant pour ne prendre personne par surprise et pour préparer psychologiquement la Chambre à cette demande. Voilà. ແລະສູ່ນັ້ນຄືມີພຽບປ້ອນໃຫ້ມັນແມ່ນຊິຕໍານູຈໍາໄດ້ <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. May it be good day. So, welcome, Mr. Heather. Once again, good morning, Mr. Heather. So, um, Mr. President, Heather, just a moment, don't forget. You've been hearing three days. Look, ma'am, just look at the questioning from the prosecution and the civil parties. Um, um, I have been asked to be called by the prosecution and the civil parties. All the questions were put to you in your capacity as a witness. You've heard numerous objections from the defense when the defense was thinking that uh, an expert opinion was solicited. Um, but the question that maybe a lot of people uh, would like to ask you hasn't been asked yet. Uh, you have been summoned as a witness because, as I have understood, you have refused to appear as an expert. You might be aware that the trial chamber has considered you to be an expert on the relative matters. In the words of the prosecution, you are indeed um, the world's leading academic in the of the um, um, my question is simple. Um, what made you decide not to appear as an There are some interrelated reasons. Um, it's indeed true, if I understand it correctly, that the trial chamber considered me as an expert. Um, and I guess defense through its submission did so as well. Um, however, uh, when I was assigned to the Office of the co-investigating judges, I was definitely not considered to be an expert. Um, Judge Lamond once remarked to me that I'm the expert, that is, Judge Lamond is the expert, not you. Um, and there's, there's a level at which, well, there, so to my, to my un legally untutored mind, it seems to me there's some dispute about 
um, I approach the question in my capacity as a scholar or an academic, um, which may or may not be the same thing as an expert. Um, it's no accident that, generally speaking, I think, most academics don't express themselves nor expose themselves to situations in which they express themselves, as it were, for the record um, in a question and answer format. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into things about intellectual snobbery and all of that, but the normal mode of academic expression is through published materials. Um, and there's a process by which those published materials are produced. You write something, you read it, you think that's crazy what I wrote. You revise it. You read it a couple more times, you revise it a couple of more times. Uh, you send it out to your peers who are friendly or at least whom you feel you can rely upon not to betray some confidence or to you know, act in a hostile manner in your regard. They make suggestions about what you should maybe read additionally or think about additionally or what seems to them not to make sense. And then you send it off for publication. And at that point, it's sent around for peer review. And at that point, you might get some very hostile but anonymous commentary about your work, which you have to often have to take into account before you publish. And then finally, after a process that may take months, if not years, on the length of the piece, with luck, it sees the light of day. And at that point, it's in the public domain, and it becomes the subject of academic debate. And it's that sort of that last stage, which is the, uh, as it were, adversarial part of the process. And to my mind, that's the right format for an academic or a scholar to express themselves. Not in the question and answer format to which I'm being uh, subjected or which I've give, been given an opportunity to, to, to have uh, in, in the court. Um, so I, I, I would rather do it, express my expert opinion if I have an expert opinion based on my scholarship and, and so on in the proper academic mode. And in that regard, I would know that regardless of debates about procedural issues and the actual substance of the resulting work product, uh, previous experts, or people who've been considered experts, people like Craig Etchison and people like the demographers who did the demographic report followed more or less that route. They were commissioned by somebody or another within the court to write about something. I'm sure they sat down and they drafted it and then they redrafted it and they drafted, redrafted it yet again. And then it was submitted. And um, on the basis of what was submitted, they were then questioned. And that seems to me to be a better way of soliciting an expert opinion. Um, that takes me to, sorry, taking time, takes me to my second point. Uh, that, that process obviously takes time. In other words, if I was going to do something like that, I would have wanted to have been, ha had several months at least to prepare my report. I wasn't asked to prepare a report uh, for whatever reason. Um, if I were to be asked to, to, to prepare a report, as I said, it would take me probably several, several months in my mind to do it right. And that takes me to my third point, which is sometime around the end of 2011, I decided that I no longer wanted to have all of my intellectual and other energies focused on the Khmer Rouge. You know, when I first started looking at the Khmer Rouge in 1973, it was current events. 
I've always been interested in current events. I'm a political scientist. I've taught the whole of Southeast Asia. And while you all, or most of you all, were undergoing the steep learning curve about the Khmer Rouge in power, I felt myself being de-skilled in terms of the rest of my interests and qualifications. So at the, at the, around the end of 2011, I decided um, no more Khmer Rouge for now, and if I may be allowed to say so, decided no more Khmer Rouge tribunal forever. Um, and that was because I wanted to concentrate on other things. And if you look at my recent proper academic publications, none of them are about the Khmer Rouge anymore. They're all about contemporary Southeast Asian politics. Um, so for those reasons, all combined together, I, as I put it in my email, respectfully declined to be an expert. Thank you for that long answer. So, um, so I'd, 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 I'd like, like to take you back to the very first sentence, or one of the very first sentences uh, of your reply, um, when Judge Marcel Le Monde told you that you are not an expert, but that he is the expert. Do you remember if he um, gave any arguments supporting that position? Um, yes, I mean, at, at, maybe not at the deepest level, but at the level of explaining that, in his view, it wasn't appropriate for someone who was an investigator, researcher, analyst inside the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges to also, at the same time, be an expert. And he didn't, uh, at the time or subsequently to my recollection, ever, as it were, cite chapter and verse from his legal tradition uh, to back up that explanation, semi-explanation with a reasoned legal judgment, if you will. Uh, but he was very strongly of that view. I mean, Robert Petit also said, once said something somewhat similar to me, which is, I'm the prosecutor and you're not. Um, so, you know, this was a, 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 a view that had a certain currency in those two two contexts. Um, I don't know, you know, so, so uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in a position to judge these issues, but if I may, one more point, I mean, I, I thought about, I thought a lot about what's been going on back and forth between yourself and prosecution and civil parties. Um, and tried to think about it in academic terms. Um, and it seems to me there are two ends of the spectrum here. One end of the spectrum is what you all, or some of you all, seem to call a witness. And the other end of the spectrum is something that you or you all seem to call an expert. Um, and to, to use an analogy, if somebody were to ask me, what time did the sun come up this morning? ពាក្យពន្ធទៅនឹងអង្គហេតុដល់ចម្រះមានបំណងចង់ស្ដាប់នោះទេសូមមេត្តវីតាំងសំណួរចូលទៅនឹងសំណួរទាំងឡាយដ
ហើយគាត់បង្ហាញខ្លួនក្នុងអង្គជំនុំ Just to, um, to make an argument why I'm asking these questions, Mr. Uh, President, it goes directly to the reliability or the credibility of this witness, and uh, I think it is also in the light of earlier questions of the prosecution only fair to ask what the considerations were. But I will move on and, uh, and ask the question maybe in a different way, uh, Mr. Heather, based on your research, based on all your interviews, based on all the articles that you have um, seen and read, Is Professor Chandler one of the leading experts on the DK period? Uh, Mr. President, I, I object to this question. Uh, what it really amounts to is what's your opinion of or what's the received opinion of Professor Chandler? If my learned friend wants to quote from a particular part of one of Mr. Hedder's books referencing this question or referencing Professor Chandler, there are in fact many references in Mr. Hedder's books to Professor Chandler. If it's a direct question to a direct extract from one of Mr. Hedder's books, I have no objection, but otherwise this is an opinion question seeking an opinion answer. I will rephrase, Mr. President. Um, the question is whether the court has made a decision on communism. There's a forward of communism. Can you describe for us why it was he who? wrote a forward to your book. Um, I think I can do this not by citing my own opinion, but by referring to the opinion of other scholars and particularly historians of Southeast Asia, uh, with whom I've obviously had much contact over now many, too many decades as far as my age is concerned. Um, I mean, anybody who is, has been a historian of Southeast Asia, particularly writing in English or French, uh, considers David Chandler the doyen of modern Cambodian historical works. Uh, so uh, any, any, anyone would suggest that if you want your work to have credibility in the community of historians of Southeast Asia, it is a good thing to have an endorsement uh, from David Chandler. In the publications that you have read um, about Professor Ben Kiernan, um, would you say the same thing as you have said now in respect of uh, Professor Chandler? Um, no, certainly not in the scholarly 
the parts of the scholar, scholarly community in which I normally travel. Uh, there may be other parts of that community because by its very nature it is intellectually split and full of contestation. Where the view might be different, but certainly in my circles, which may be a reflection in part of my own views, like, 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 um, the opinion of his work is uh, not as high. Is it correct when I say that you have extensively criticized uh, the work of Ben Kiernan in your own publications? Uh, yes, and vice versa, and that's, as I suggested earlier, that's normal, that's the adversarial part of scholarship, which arguably is somewhat analogous to what happens in the courtroom. Have you, do you know, uh, read all Ben Keenan's publications? Um, without being churlish, I think I can say he tends to be even more long-winded than me. Uh, I can't say that I've read every page of everything he's ever written, but I certainly read, I think, every page of everything he's ever written about Cambodia. Now let me, if you allow me, go back again to um, yourself. Um, both Keenan, both Chandler are um, professors. Um, you do not seem to have that title, but that would you be able to explain why it is that you are not a professor in uh, political science or political history or uh, something equivalent? Would you like to ask that question? Uh, I object, Mr. President, on the sole ground of relevance. What relevance does this have? Only evidence that is relevant is admissible. In my submission, this is irrelevant. In, in my reply, Mr. President, this is a relevant question so directly to the person of this witness. ដោយតោះរបស់ដំណើរសាព្រៃញាមានមូលហេតុនិងសំអាងហេតុត្រឹមត្រូវសំនួរនេះមិនមានភាពពាក់ព័ន្ធទេដូច្នេះសាក់
without you know without the equivalent of the document before me ពីអេកសារ <coughs> It is document E131 slash 1 in the first page of that article in the footnote, um, you write that you would like to thank certain people for their contribution to this publication. You uh, mentioned David Chandler, but you also mentioned, among others, Laura Summers. Would you be able to explain to us who this Laura Summers is in the footnote that you're referring to? Um, Laura Summers is someone who was a PhD student doing a PhD at Cornell, no, when I was Cornell. an undergraduate no, there, which would have been in the early 70s, that is before I came to Cambodia in 73, um, and subsequently has taught in a number of universities in the UK. So uh, she was in the UK, um, or coming and going from the UK, uh, at the time this article was written. Um, her PhD work was on Cambodia. Uh, she also did a translation of Christopher's dissertation, uh, introduction, giving an, an analysis of its significance, historical, political, and otherwise. So, in short, she's a fellow academic. Um, thank you. Now we talk. Now retired, I heard you say. Um, let me get back uh, to a question on your um, personal background, Mr. Hedder. Um, yesterday and also the week before, I heard you in answering questions of the prosecu prosecutors uh, often refer to um, documents or other information that you between 1973 and 1975 from military attaches uh, working for the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. Consul. Um, could you expand a little more on the context that you had in those days with U.S. military attaches? Um, if I recall correctly, within the U.S. Embassy context, there was something called MedTech, military something, something, something. I forget exactly what it stood for. Um, by, by U.S. law, um, U.S. military involvement in Cambodia was severely restricted in terms of on-the-ground um, involvement. Uh, 
There were supposed to be no U.S. ground troops. Um, and I think there were certain restrictions on aid and certainly restrictions on advice. So neither ground troops, if I recall correctly, neither U.S. ground troops nor, yet, nor U.S. military advisors were legally allowed in Cambodia. Uh, but there was this MedTech part of the U.S. Embassy or attached to the U.S. Embassy, which I, uh, the main brief of which I think was the overseeing of the provision of military aid, material aid. Um, Alongside that, as is normal in every American embassy or almost every American embassy, there's a military attaché, there's an apparatus known as the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, and those are staffed like MedTech was by serving military officers. I think there are sometimes some civilian analysts also attached to those officers. I'm not sure about that. So um, I had contact with some of those people, in, either in MedTech or in the Defense Attaché's office or in the Defense Intelligence office, um, with whom I discussed the military situation um, and from whom on occasion I got a document or two. Um, if you're going to ask me who those people were, off the top of my head, I frankly don't remember the names. I can try and find out, take a bit of time, um, but that doesn't stick in my memory, nor in the same way that the name of the Japanese military attaché doesn't stick in my memory either. Now, if I understand your earlier testimony correctly, you had arrived uh, in 73 uh, in, in Cambodia. You worked as a journalist. Um, would you be able to compare yourself with other journalists then in terms of your access to uh, military, these U.S. military attaches? Was that something that you remember had um, more in terms of contact than the other journalists? Um, I would say it was about average. Um, I think you know, some of the more senior correspondents who had much more experience and much better developed and established contacts uh, in the U.S. government realm probably had much better access than I did. I think there were some who maybe didn't cultivate these particular kinds of sources uh, to the extent that I did you know, and therefore had fewer contacts. But I don't. I don't. I certainly didn't have special access, uh, nor was I, for some reason or another, excluded or self-excluded from contact with that part of the U.S. official establishment. Do you remember at the time um, interacting, or even talking, whatever? with a uh, fellow journalist called Sidney Chamber. Um, yeah, as you know, Sydney wasn't full-time resident in Phnom Penh. He came and went. Um, I had some contact, but I wouldn't say a lot with Sydney. So you wouldn't be able to tell from your memory, if he had substantial contacts or the same kind of contacts that you had with U.S. military attaches? Uh, no, the relationship between myself and Sydney was not such that that was the kind of information we shared. Um, In those years, and maybe also afterwards, uh, Mr. Hader, were you ever in whatever way uh, employed as an U.S. intelligence officer? Uh, the short answer is no. And the long answer? Uh, the long answer 
is that in the period between 1979 and 1984, um, I, I periodically had research funding from something called the Office of External Research of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research of the U.S. Department of State. Um, and that was on the basis of a contract, um, which uh, at one point I understood meant that I'd been employed by the Department of State. But subsequently, I, as a result of some tax matters in, in my payment of taxes in the U.S. and the U.K., and having to sort that out uh, in terms of my income and salary and so on, it, it, it's now clear to me that that shouldn't be understood as employment. Um, it was grant money funding, not salary. Um, it was... Um, research um, as an expert, as it happens, uh, not employment. So, um, although it, it and it's it's like the same it's the same kind of situation that I described with regard to my other research funding. The money comes to your academic institution or through your academic institution, and you, then you are paid through that route. So it's income, but it's not salary. It's grant, but it's not employment. And the other point that probably is worth making is that it's research intelligence gathering, intelligence analysis in the public domain. In other words, both the sources and the work product are in the public domain, and therefore it's not covert operations. So in that sense, the U.S. government is one of the three governments from which I've received funding over the years. I mentioned, I think, in earlier testimony, the British government for some of the research that I did at DC CAM. Um, and I was also uh, employed in that sense, but in fact not employment, had grant money um, by the Thai government, Thai National Commission for UNESCO at one point. So the technical answer is no. Um, did you um, ever in sometime in 2003, um, submit a book proposal under a working title Genocide and Autogenocide in Cambodia, Communism, Nationalism and Murder, 1975 Um I submitted a number of book proposals in that period. I can't be absolutely sure that that's one of them, but it might well be. Did you, when you made possibly this book proposal, um, an accompanying remark saying that you researched the CPK for 30 years as a journalist and, and also as an intelligence officer. The normal formulation I used was intelligence analyst because that was the rubric under which the grant was uh, made. Intelligence um, gathering and intelligence analysis. Uh, to my recollection, the grant rubric was not intelligence officer, but I may have glossed it in that document. Um, I think another point that's worth making in, that, in this context um, is that that Office of External Research, of Bureau of Intelligence Research, of U.S. Department of State grant money was to do research not on the CPK while it was in power, that is to say not on the period of, of, of the temporal jurisdiction of, of the court, but on the post-79 period, and in fact it was part of a larger study that looked at the global situation in Cambodia after 1979. And again, all the results are, 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 were, were either published or circulated as academic papers. Do you um, know a book 
Mr. Weda, Mr. Hedda, are you... Um, Some new, look at the... They send look at Mr. V. Some change look at Chakram. Thank you, President. Just a technical matter, Mr. Corpi. Uh, this book has a D number, um, has been put before the chamber, please. And what is its title? It's uh, before the chamber. It is um, trying to decipher the ERN number. There's a black, um, black mark through it. It's, I think it's zero zero four eight nine six six zero. It is an official D, uh, D number attached to it. It is on the case file. Uh, here I have the uh, the, the proper ERN number is zero zero four eight eight three six zero. But has it been put before the chamber and what is its title? Its title is uh, Ben Kien and Genocide and Resistance in Southeast Asia. And it's only Has it been put before the chamber? I have to get back to you on that with that answer, Judge Cartwright. I will I will um, rephrase my question in more general terms. Uh, Mr. Are you aware that, um, ben Keenan qualifies you as an intelligence officer? Um, I don't recall specifically having noted that, but it may well be. And on the basis of the same confusion about the exact nature of the relationship between myself and I and I, which, as I explained, is a confusion about whether the contractual arrangement actually made me an employee of the U.S. government or not. The answer to that question is not. In the same way that my funding from the British Embassy here in Phnom Penh didn't make me an employee of the British government, and my funding from the Thai National Commission for UNESCO, which is a state body in Thailand, didn't make me an employee, an employee of the Thai government. My exact job title um, is uh, something that's a bit hazier. As I said, with regard to the I&R work, the rubric and the contract, as I recall, it was intelligence gathering and intelligence analysis. Um, and one could summarize that as, yes, as intelligence also. Thank you. Let me move on. Mr. Hedder, to uh, no, had, uh, an answer that you gave to questions from the prosecution uh, last week in the very beginning. Uh, you testified that um, you applied for a position um, at the UNAKRT. Uh, uh, 
after you received that position I cried almost immediately some time in 2006 you were detached at uh, the request of Prosecutor Petit to work uh, as an analyst or researcher or whatever for the prosecution. Can I summarize correctly your answer? Um, yes. When you were given on loan, so to speak, uh, to the prosecution, uh, was it clear to you that after a while you would go back um, to the Office of the Investigating Judge. Um, it was certainly clear to Judge Lamont. Um, I think maybe Prosecutor Petit had different plans or hopes, and I was caught somewhere in between those two perceptions or persons. Do you remember uh, specific in the light of this specific decision uh, anything from Judge Lamont in terms of um, the possibility of a conflict of interest once you would come back uh, to the Office of the Investigating Judges? Um, if I recall correctly, his view was that the Anglo-Saxons might think that way, but of course they would be wrong. Do you remember if he gave any arguments to back up this um, position? Um, frankly, Judge Lamont wasn't prone to explain his managerial decisions to his staff with extensive legal reasoning. When you were working uh, for the prosecution in 2006 before you returned, did you make recommendations to uh, the prosecutors about, for instance, going to meet you? Uh, I, I only... Uh, object at this stage. I've not objected to the previous questions. Um, there have been a variety of decisions about the extent of questioning um, in terms of other phases of the um, trial process. I have before me a decision from the 7th of December 2012. Um, the ECC legal framework does not envisage examination by the trial chamber of the procedural correctness of the judicial investigation upon being seized of the case file. Uh, it seems to me we're veering into that territory. I'll of course be guided, given what Judge Cartwright said uh, on day one of the examination of Mr. Hedda, but in my respectful submission, we're getting into the sort of territory that uh, Her Honour Judge Cartwright was cautioning against. But I'm, of course, in the court's hands, but it seems to me we are in that territory, and for that reason I object. Um, if I may reply, uh, Mr. President, I know I'm aware of your ruling um, on this issue. It's not my intention to go into big detail as to the work activities of this witness uh, when he was employed by the prosecution. I do have a few general questions about um, uh, sort of the general terms of his work there. So I do not go into any specifics in respect of the names of witnesses or just some general questions as to, to be able to understand uh, the things that he has done in general terms once again uh, when he was working with the prosecution.
ពតិវេជ្ជទោសនៅកំអាងហេតុនៃសេចក្តីជំទោសរបស់រំណាងសហព្រះញ្ញាចំពោះសំណួរចំក្រោយដែលសួរឡើងដោយ then may the at least be possible to um, for the record ha have me pronounce the four or five questions that i have ដាក់ខ្ញុំសូមសួរតាសំណួរបីគួលនៅខ្ញុំបានសួរហើយដែលមិនអាចនិយាយ <coughs> សាក់ស្អីម៉ាច់ឆ្លើយតបទៅនឹងសំណួរនេះទេសូមឲ្យលោកមេតវីបន្តការតាំងសំណួរសារធិតដែលពាក់ព័ន្ធទៅនឹង
in 2006 they were offered in their entirety but they weren't all taken. In other words, uh, I offered everything, um, but much of it was declined. More particularly, did you offer original copies, original versions of revolutionary flags? Do you remember specifically giving these? Um, Documents to the investigation. Yes. Do you have any knowledge as to where these uh, original revolutionary flags are? Now, the ones that you gave. To the court? No, I, I didn't give them. I offered them. They were declined, so I took. I, 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 they're the same ones that ended up later in the possession of the court. So these documents, among others, uh, were offered. They were declined. Um, so at some point, I took them back to London, and then when the court asked for them, the trial chamber asked for them, then I supplied them. Um, the reason I'm asking you this question is well, the background of the question is the following. Um, our client Nunchia, um, would really like to see as to what to have in his hands an original version of one of the revolutionary flags. Now you, as, an, as, a, as a scholar, as an, as an academic, who has researched um, the period extensively, can you tell us how an original version of a revolutionary flag um, could be placed here, so to speak, not literally, of course, but here in the middle, so that he can see uh, the authenticity, the authenticity of it. Just, in, just in terms of general procedure, um, how to, uh, based on your experience and your knowledge, how to uh, be able to get uh, an, 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 an original uh, an original version of the revolution. Mr. President, I can't see how it's appropriate to ask Mr. Heather how this could, how could this could be shown. Two documents were shown yesterday in red. They're on the case file. I gave them our numbers. I don't understand why this line of questioning is being pursued. The red flags that they are are on our case file. The red ones on our case file with a case number. Why are we asking how does Nunchia access it? Press a button on the computer and it comes up on the screen. What's the problem? Mr. President, I'm just trying to um, make the witness understand the background of my question. The question is about, um, but let me rephrase it, Mr. Witness, could you explain how in your, in, in your research and, 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 and the writing of your academic article got into the possession of these original revolutionary flags? Um, As I think I explained, um, when I came to the Dorslang Genocide Museum, which I did first in late 1980, and then again in 1981, but I believe all of this happened on the first occasion, uh, I was shown by the then archivist a collection of revolutionary, flag, revolutionary flags uh, revolutionary youth and some other evidently 
original CPK document um, um, in the situation where there was no photocopy facility available um, they decided to give me original from that collection of which there were other originals um, so they gave me those originals, and then in 1981, and then on numerous subsequent visits to the Dual Slide Genocide Museum, um, I made photocopies once photocopying was a technical possibility of all the other revolutionary flags, stroke flags, and revolutionary youth uh, that they had in their possession. I'm trying to think whether there are, uh, there are some, certain, some photocopies in my files which came off of revolutionary flag flags or revolutionary youth that are in the possession of DC CAM. I don't specifically recall whether those are photocopies of originals or photocopies of photocopies. The upshot of all of this is that in addition to the ones that I eventually, having previously offered them and then been told they weren't needed, having eventually been asked by the trial chamber to provide the two, I take it, missing originals, I provided those two. I'm pretty sure that I didn't get rid of the other originals in my possession somewhere along the line, so they're probably somewhere in those 45 filing cabinets of paper materials that I have on various aspects of Cambodian politics, including the Khmer Rouge. So if there are missing editions, in theory, with sufficient time, I might be able to find them. When was the last time that you had in your hands physically um, documents like those revolutionary flags or S21 confessions, uh, and particularly the ones with uh, the alleged annotations of Nguyen Chi on it. Do you remember when you had those physically in your hand? Um, well, would have brought them with me to Cambodia in the middle of 2006. Um, I recall the presumption having been at the office of the co-prosecutors that other originals were available in other locations, and therefore they would be obtained from other locations. Uh, when I first went to Office of the Co-Prosecutors, um, I offered these documents, they were declined. Uh, when the introductory submission came, um, in the middle of 2007, is it July 2007, the introductory submission, they were offered again and again declined. So I probably brought them back to London maybe around Christmas of 2007, the next time I went to London. I don't remember exactly when, but most likely sometime in the latter part of 2007, I packed up all the stuff that I had brought that hadn't been taken or copied either by prosecution or the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges and took it home and put it back in the filing cabinet. Um, and also written that you have extensively studied uh, um, a very concrete question. Do you know, on the basis of your research and um, your academic writing, where exactly um, you confessions with the alleged um, signature of Nunchia, where they are, where they are physically situated. Um, 
I think the answer to that is no, because I'll back up to your earlier question. Among all those documents, there are very, very, very few my doc, documents in my possession. There are very, very, very few that are original S21 material. Um, the archivists weren't happy to leave any of that stuff leave the building on a couple of occasions when there were like seven or eight carbon copies. They gave me one of the carbon copies. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the S21 confession material that's in my possession is photocopies. So originals, um, either I have never seen or I don't know where the originals are. Um, I've only seen a very few of them. Other than the, I mean, I saw the originals that were filed in the Duoslang Genocide Museum, and many of my copies are copies from there, but those, generally speaking, from what I have seen, are not the ones that are annotated. The ones that are annotated come, to my knowledge, from a different location, not specifically or directly known to me, than those that were originally on file. Um, at the Tulslang Genocide Museum. Just to make sure that I understand your answer, the, the um, 15, 20 plus confessions with the signature allegedly belonging to Nigeria, the whereabouts of the, the, the actual originals you do not know. Now, thinking about it again, if I recall correctly, the, on the case file, there are color scans of said documents. Um, and my recollection is that I did some of those color scans myself while at the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges, but in, on, on, the, on the grounds of DC CAM. So at the point in time when I did those color scans, the originals, if I recall correctly, from which I made the scans, were at DC camp. Doesn't mean they're necessar they were necessarily stored there. They were brought to me in a photocopy room. Uh, I used a scanner that was a photocopier to do the scans, and then they went back to wherever they came from. Where that wherever is, I don't know. And would you be able to tell how you we're able to determine whether these specific confessions with that signature on it were in fact authentic and original um, uh, it seems to me that's an expert opinion question. Uh, I object. I, 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 I'll re rephrase. Mm. Um, when you saw those documents that were handed to you, um, did you do anything um, in order to come to some assessment of its authenticity? No. I might, I might come back to this subject, uh, Mr. Head, let me move on to the next subject, and that is something uh, as an answer that you gave earlier uh, in your testimony to the question of the prosecution, and that is the interview that you apparently had with K. Pock. Um, now, if I remember correctly, um, this material on that, uh, in the interview uh, was, was you were allowed to give that free once K-Pok had died. 
Uh, as I understand as well, you try to offer this material um, to the office of the investigating, co investigating judges. Uh, they didn't want to accept it, and now it is stored. Literally, you said somewhere in your 75 cabinets, 45, sorry, 45 cabinets. In London. Um, do you remember what was told to you uh, when you offered this specific um, testimony, as I might call it, of K-pop to you? Mr. President, really, it's a two, two-fold objection. One going back to the direction that the trial chamber is not interested in what judges said or didn't say or what OCIJ said about material that was being given is the first point. And the second one, again, just simply on relevance. What's the relevance of what somebody said about some piece of evidence that's not on the case file? How does that assist you in determining the truth? I'm just trying to establish, uh, Mr. President, um, what exactly happened to the alleged testimony of Kapok. We have been speaking extensively about the interviews at the Inksari and Kirsakon to the witness. Uh, there seems to be an interview with Kapok, um, but we don't have a, a transcript as we have when it comes to the interviews of this witness with all these other people. So I'm trying to find out what happened, um, and I'm trying to find out why, um, or if the witness has any knowledge as to why um, nobody seems to be interested in this particular testimony. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, la Chambre tient à observer que l'interview de Kepok euh, est un, un élément de preuve qui euh, est versé devant elle, donc c'est un élément qu'elle sera amenée à apprécier. La question de savoir pourquoi cette interview n'a pas été versée au dossier au stade de l'instruction est une question qui nous paraît dénuée de pertinence et nous vous demandons donc de passer à un autre sujet. With, with all respect, I didn't ask anything about placing on the case file, but I'll, I'll move on and, and ask the question more specifically. Uh, I'm referring to um, document E190.1.398. ERN. Um, and that is your footnote. Um, it's, your, it's your article reassessing the role of senior leaders and local officials. And in that footnote 14 that you have been, that the prosecution has been referring to earlier, you, uh, you speak about 
uh, the interview that you had um, with K-pop. Um, then going back uh, to this particular footnote, um, and I quote from that footnote as follows. In an interview with the author on 22nd of February 2001 in Sivit, Cambodia, Pok agreed to discuss evidence against himself and others on the condition that his remarks not be made public while he was alive. He conceded that as a secretary of the CPK North, later Central Zone Committee, he had implemented a CPK policy of killing Khmer Republic officials, initiated the arrest and ordered the execution of alleged traitors among CPK members subordinated to him, and followed orders from Nguyen to assist in the arrest of other alleged traitors in the CPK ranks whom he knew would be executed after interrogation by the CPK Security Service Headquarters S21 in Phnom Penh. Um, this footnote in your article seems to suggest that this is, um, at least in that particular footnote, the only evidence used by you to establish a possible link between um, a policy to kill and the role of Nguyen Would that be a fair summary of that footnote 14? The next words talk about corroboration, and in order for this question to be properly placed in context before Mr. Heder, there needs to be reference in my respectful submission to the next sentence and the word corroboration and identifying where the corroboration was from and whether the corroboration went to the element of the question. It's wrong to suggest to a witness that something is not corroborated when the next sentence talks about corroboration. I think this witness is perfectly capable of uh, correcting me if I make a wrong suggestion when it comes to a footnote, first of all. Secondly, I would like to remind the, the chamber that uh, when my learned friend was quoting extensively from a passage um, of an interview of Kyu Sam Pong, um, he left out the very last sentence referring to uh, East Zone Cadre Heng Sam Rin. So now to, um, to express a problem with me not quoting the complete footnote seems to be uh, quite odd, I might add. So uh, it is a footnote, it's about a footnote that this particular uh, witness wrote in an article, and I'm sure he's able to assist uh, the chamber uh, and the defense uh, in answering the question whether uh, the K-pop testimony was the only testimony relevant to a possible role of Nguyen Chia. ว่าสาธิตอาจฉลอยตอบเตือนสมนุเรสวนนี้ประเทศนิบาลปนแต่อองค์ประชาชนรวมเลือกดอลเมตวีและการพิจารณาลงนุ่นชี้รวมเตีย
my, my question reformulated would be um, whether K-pop was in fact the only source for your uh, for the paragraph in your article that there was a link between the policy and um, kill and target lone officials and soldiers and the role, the possible role of um, I mean, the obvious answer is that whatever is said above footnote 14 is based on whatever appears in footnote 14, um, which is not to say that there might be evidence elsewhere that's not included in the footnote that speaks to the same issue, um, which was left out of the footnote or which I was not in my possession at the time the piece was written. But yes, of course. I'd be happy for your memory to, to read the, uh, the paragraph that this footnote is referring to. Mr. President, every time I put a footnote to Mr. Header, he had the full document in front of him. Can he please be shown full documents and not just have them put up on the screen? This is important evidence, and in my respectful submission, Mr. Header should be given the courtesy of being given this document in hard copy so that he can follow the question. I'd be happy to do that. Um, Um, again, I mean, I can only say that I must have considered this, to use loosely the legal phrase, but only in an academic sense. Um, this was the best available evidence that I had at the time to substantiate the conclusion of the assertion that's contained in the, the sentence that ends with footnote four, number 14. Hence my question, if you remember, um, why nothing was done with your offer to, uh, to give that um, the transcript of the interview. But I will move on, Mr. President. Um, I'm mindful of the time. I'm going to questions of methodology now. It is 10.30. I'd be happy to move on, but I your hands, Mr. President. អរគុណលលិតដល់ពេលសម្រាក់ហើយមានប្រកាសសម្រាក់ចាប់ពីនេះទៅទៅលោកដល់ម៉ោងដល់ 11 ខ្វះ